So uh, I, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Aaron Rampal. Uh, I am a PhD. Uh, I have a PhD in sociology. Uh, oh, actually, let me just tell you guys. Let me just remind you guys why you're here. This is the um, Let's Play uh, panel uh, talking about mental health and fandom and all of that good stuff. I am your uh, substitute moderator. Uh, so heads up, seven up, and. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're gonna play Heads Up Seven Up. I'm a, I am a substitute teacher. We are playing Woo. Heads Up Seven Up. This is I am in. I am that guy. I basically oh, we got just. Jordan. All right, everybody's all here. Right. Yay! All right. Woo. Perfect. Hello, hello. Don't rely on your car to work on a day you have something important to do. Yeah. Mental health um, pointer there, right there. No worry. We, 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 I'm glad everybody's here, so now I can be less nervous than I am. So I'm just going to go and introduce like the rest of the panelists on the line. Uh, again, I'm, um, I'm Aaron. You guys don't even have to call me by my title or anything. I just call me Aaron. Uh, I'm fine with that. And I do find the irony of me dressing up as Sabretooth on a panel about mental health. It's awesome. This is by design. Sabretooth um, has a lot to work through. He has a lot. He, it, mental health is a journey, everyone. All right? Yes. This, Forwards and backwards. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, we have Rachel Klinger. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. Chelsea Schwartz. Yes. And I'm going to refer to her by her ch um, chosen pronoun, boss babe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I have on my list right now. She is a mental health advocate and someone who lives with high functioning depress depression as a highly sensitive person. Founder of, nerd, founder of nerd culture publication, High Voltage, and has been working in nerd culture since 2003. Uh, currently, she, um, Boss Babe here is the head of marketing and events for Scum and Villainy Cantina. I love that bar. Oh, thank you. And a Disney micro-influencer and actor. Uh, we'll go over socials toward the end. Uh, to her left, we have, finally, Rachel Klinger. Uh, she is a suicide crisis worker for six years. She's began MSW studies, social change, and mental health advocate of um, neurodiversity for over two decades, leader in various geek initiatives since 2001, from fundraisers to social events, and started a 501c3. To her left, we have Jordan Barlam, ACSW. Uh, he's been working in mental health and Skid Row for the past two years. Grew up watching anime, me too. Uh, have a great fondness for the recent waves of quality animation, Adventure Time, Over the Garden Wall, My Little Pony, Steven Universe, etc. And has attended cons on and off since high school. So, um, wanna, first of all, thank everybody for making the time to come in this morning. I know it's hot, the traffic is crazy. Um, and that air quality outside, whew. Goodness, uh, for everybody who came here from the Valley, thank you guys especially, and I hope you guys are safe. I hope none of you had to evacuate and that all of your homes are okay. Right. And I personally hope that none of you had to just run up three flights of stairs. <laughs> also inadvisable in this hot weather. There's an elevator right next to that, which my. Which, but is it working? Which, which, which was pointed out to me actually too. So I had to also come up those steps in a pair of shoes I've never worn before. Don't I took do the that. escalator. See, the escalator was off when I was. <laughs> it this was is also what the, This is he what found, the panel's about, y'all. one good escalator. <laughs> All right, so I have magic. So um, a couple things we want to we, we want to discuss um and i just want to get you guys this point of view on things as well and I'll, I'll jump in as well as needed um what do you guys are some of you guys pros and cons on escapism with fandom and cosplay pros and cons pros and cons hmm. i i would say i mean a big just part of fandom for me is the ability to disconnect from the stress of real world and find some sort of joy like i i love disney I, I was that child growing up that like loves the hopeless romantic aspect of Disney, the positivity. Like, I I go to Disneyland a couple times a week. I just uh, I feel like the real world has so much drama and constant stress around it that like I need something that gives me hope that there's something beyond that. So I personally love escaping to my happy place. I feel that um, I could definitely talk about both in this. I think that it is, the form of escape um, can also be used, is very often used as a coping mechanism. As uh, Aaron said in my intro, I am a crisis worker. And sometimes when, and I know that there is like, you know, that line that needs to be drawn, like, oh, don't get too into it. And for a while until the nerd renaissance, 
being into fandoms was always looked down as like, oh, you're escaping reality. But the thing is, it's 2019 in modern America. I think that if we don't turn our brains off for a second, it's hard to get by. That's not how the human brain works. So I think that when I do crisis sessions and someone's able to just turn off, especially those who, have con who suffer from anxiety and depression, just that constant noise for just a minute and not replace it with just anything, but the stories that we're all in this room for are stories of heroes and even flawed anti-villains. So the fact that we could not, it feels a little bit like turning off, but the fact that we could even learn from them has a lot of power. And I think that is important to remember. I actually want to go off of what Rachel just said about, it be, about escapism being a form of coping. And to be clear, escapism is much more than what we normally think of it. Yeah. Yes, it can be movies. Yes, it can be a book. Yes, it can be an anime. But so is listening to a good song and imagining you being part of that great romance being described within. Most of our forms of relaxation, to some degree or another, are a moment of escapism from our everyday life. And coping mechanisms, hugely important. That's what lets us handle the stress of it being 2019 modern America, yeah. of, and the daily stresses that we deal in every day to tank those and keep going forward. I mean, I think coping mechanism is an interesting cho uh, choice of phrase, and it's accurate, but I just like to call it recharging my batteries. Yeah. And, and even in and, and tie-in on that, uh, first and foremost, shout out to Gandalf for shutting the door. Yes, thank you um, so much. Um, appreciate that. Uh, they, they shall, shall not pass. pass. There we yes. go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the like using it as a coping mechanism. That I think that's just like um, it, it's it's completely true because we all have ways to cope with different things. But like use saying it as escapism, uh, in the same time, like with the way media is now and the way we consume media, like a lot of things you can relate. A lot of things that we like that we're fans of, we find something in ourselves that we like. Yes, it's it. so relatable. You know, like uh, tonight, uh, My Hero Academia comes back on. Uh, I'll be watching it. And um, we know what you're doing tonight. Uh, and a couple things, but like, but but it's so much in that that I can relate to just like just as a 35-year-old adult, I can still latch on to some things in there. And it, it yes, it takes me out of my current reality. I'm looking at something else. But at the same time, I can still use that to reflect on what's going on in my life as well. And it helps. So. There's a lot of, uh, I, I, there's been tons of TV shows, films, movies that have helped me. Uh, there's also a lot of things that I like. I'm a huge Tolkien fan. I dream about living in the Shire in a simpler time and just eating food off the land and like whole foods. And like, it's such a simple dream of like going back to nature. But then there's also like events that have really helped me. Uh, as you said earlier, I am a highly sensitive person. I have high functioning depression. I have a lot of social anxieties. And uh, around seven years ago, I decided to leave the music industry, which had been my entire life for like 25 years. And I, don't, I know I don't look that old, but I am a lot older than I look. Uh, and I was like, I don't know what I wanna do. All I've done my entire life since I was a kid was the music industry. And I just started to watch like a lot of Netflix while I was like pondering life. And I was like, I think, I think I'm a nerd. And, <laughs> and I was like, and I, th I think I wanna do something with that and I don't know how to do it. And I ended up going to Disneyland and the Mad Tea Party had just started. It was opening weekend. And here it was, Alice in Wonderland with rock and roll. And I was like, it was the perfect merge for me of like, I was trying to find myself and I had this place I could go to that connected the world I knew and the world I wanted to be part of. And I literally will tell people that the Mad Tea Party saved my life. Like my grandmother died around that time. There was a bunch of other stress that happened. And that was the place that made me feel like I belonged somewhere. What she just said, and first of all, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. But what she just said, that moment, it was life-saving. We hear all the time with people talking about a favorite song that got them through things and or so on and so forth. However, I think something that's really important about the type of um, thing that we're into instead of a lot of other things is that it is not a passive hobby. It is 
first of all, at its height, it has, it's, a nar it's narrative storytelling. So you can't help but learn something from it sometimes, even if you don't think you are. I mean, yeah, um, they, you are watching a giant robot battle, but you're also watching this teenage kid deal with his issues with his father and inaccuracy and new dubs on Netflix if you're watching Ava. And <laughs> it's just that. Or, or how about those like moments that while you're watching it, you're pr currently processing something in life, and then the TV show seems to reflect what's currently yeah. happening, and then suddenly you're like, I have to finish the show. I need to know what happens. The like it's going to answer my life. There's <laughs> like you know. The fact that you can learn from it. Um, for example, I am dressed as uh, Princess Carolyn. From all right, we got one person mm. recognizing it, and it's from BoJack Horseman, which is just like. It's a funny show about talking animals that rip off the entertainment industry. However, it's also one of the most sophisticated stories about depression yes. and codependency that you're ever going to see. And I think, um, just to kind of go off what Chelsea said, for me personally, um, when I was coming to terms with coming out, it was during the 90s. Again, this is the panel that knows how to, we, we, we kind of hijacked like one of those good fountain of use here. And yeah. uh, <laughs> it was the 90s when I was coming out and all of the stories were that you were either, a, if you were a queer woman, you were either a joke or too ugly and mean for anyone to ever love you. Forget having a family. Then I discovered Sailor Moon and that, and to actually see them not only just be the protagonist of their stories, but not, to not only just be a special episode, but for them to be the heroes. Literal cherry blossoms flutter when they walk in. They are the role models. And I've never seen that before. To this day. All right, I'm going to start carrying cherry blossoms and just throw them at you. Yeah, like, Dude, now, you be my now, hero now. now we just have to do. And 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 for those who don't know, like when she brings up Sailor Moon, that's a very significant thing when it comes to uh, women coming out because in the American doves, they changed all of that. Uh, there were uh, two recently. characters. I want to I want to say uh, Neptune and Uranus. Oh, yeah. Or yeah, the, they were a lesbian couple. However, in the American dub, they made them cousins. Didn't change any animation, but they changed all of the dialogue. Those so, kids I babysat had a lot of questions. So they were um. they, so the, yeah, so they were cousins from a very weird part of the country <laughs> and stuff. So like it was yeah 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 from I, I wasn't gonna say it, but you said it the South yeah so. <laughs> But yeah, they, they changed all of that and took that away from people who, who probably could have used something like that because representation in, in media is, is something extremely important, which is what I want to which is what I want to go into next. Wait, like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Jordan, go ahead. No, I did, did want to ask one thing. I hate to be a bummer. I did notice our prompt was pros and cons. And while it's oh, easy yes. for us to get carried away in what we love, we want to talk about the positive aspects, escapism does have a bit of a drawback, potentially. Uh, while recharging your batteries is a nice way to put it, I use coping mechanism because that can be two-sided. In many cases, when there's a stressor that comes up, either it's something we can deal with or it's something that we can't. I cannot snap my fingers to double my income or to change the political situation. But if I have a bill that needs to be paid, or if my friends are mad with me, those are things that I can address. But if you have that bill to pay, or that friend is mad at you, and instead of addressing it, you turn to your one coping mechanism for everything. You're not addressing the problem itself, and it's something that can reasonably, reasonably be solved. And instead of doing the basic activity you need to keep life going, you turn on another episode, you read another book, you... You suppress. You suppress, and that can be harmful to a way of life. Suppression can be harmful. There's also the other con I can think of is expectation hangovers. That's what yeah. I like to call them, of like expecting life to be this fantasy that you're watching and it doesn't turn out that way. And I think the hardest lesson for me was learning about love and relationships and how much work actually goes into every kind of relationship, not just romantic, but friendships. And like, 
it, there's there's a lot of give and take and finding that flow and that balance and that can really impact your mental health when where you prioritize someone someone else isn't prioritizing you and it's uh wait, so, so and then you go and you watch a romantic comedy with Sandra Bullock and Hugh Grant and you're like why isn't that my life you know like mm. and why can't the power of love always fix everything yeah that was a really difficult lesson I think for a lot of us to learn especially in 2016 and I think it's just a matter of like to remember, but at the same time, then you can find the things that say, for example, another mental health um, series I really enjoy is called um, the title being kind of ironic, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually has a song called Life Isn't a Movie, It Doesn't Make Narrative Sense. And in one way, you could kind of then use it to, I guess the main thing about your fan, um, fandom intake is just to kind of pay attention and make sure that it remains an interactive experience, something that you're able to learn from and use in a um, constructive way. And because there's a lot that it says. Yeah, so like, um, and, and great answers, everyone. Uh, I, it, so I want to go into like another facet of like fandoms and stuff like uh, representation and how important that is like in in the realm of pretty much everything but specifically in cosplay and specifically in cons and stuff like how do you guys feel like do you guys feel represented <laughs> adequately i know i don't but um i i can I, i'll actually like start on this like i'm Please? i'm obviously i'm black um and not, I mean, that wasn't obvious. I, I know, I know, right? It's, <laughs> we hoped. I am caramel macchiato. Um, <laughs> if anyone is blind, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. I, I, I am a, a, a person of color, obviously. And a lot of my fandoms, like growing up, I've been watching, I've been, watch, I've been reading comics since I was nine. I've been watching cartoons, anime and stuff since uh, before I can even remember. Uh, and it very rare do I see, like, myself being represented and it's 2019 and it's still very rare that i see that uh, a lot of the cosplays that i wear aren't people of color uh, i make them that when i put those costumes on like right now i'm saber tooth i'm not black saber tooth i'm not hood saber tooth i'm not gangster <laughs> saber tooth i am just saber tooth that's all that's what, all what about I, homie saber tooth no, I, you know what depending on who's calling me that. <laughs> you know if you if you one of my homies i Cool, but like you know, but still, it's it's one of those things where, um, and I and another thing that was a lot of the characters that I latched on to, ironically, were uh, redhead characters because I was born with red hair, so I I can red haired people. Is, we're only like five percent of the population, so I I can latch on to those. Like Kyle from South Park and stuff was my jam, but when you go out and find that, it's it's hard to say well. I can't relate to this person because they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't sound like me, anything like that. So I grew up liking a lot of the weird characters and stuff, like Nightcrawler's my favorite X-Man. Um, people with blue skin always like stood out to me because they stood out from everybody else. I feel else. like everybody gets drawn to characters that remind them of themselves Absolutely. somehow, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, outsiders amongst the outsiders. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I always yeah. related to Mad Hatter. Megara from Hercules and Archimedes from Sword in the Stone. Oh, okay. So like, <laughs> you, you've got the independent woman, you've got yeah. the person that juggles way too many things at the same time and has to be mad to do it. Right. I was like, and then the really sarcastic Al, and I was like, I'm entirely sarcastic and annoyed by everything, like Archimedes. Like, <laughs> right, and it's like another one, and I'll pass it down to you guys, I, I really relate to All Might from My Hero Academia because he's, he's two different people. He's a big, strong dude, who's like over the top and just loud and hilarious. And then he's a skinny guy who's like stoic and, and, and serious for the most part. That's me, day to day. It's hilarious. One day I can walk in, be the life of the party. The next minute I can just be like, I really don't want to talk to anybody right now. You know, it's, it's one of those things. But I'm always somehow with, with happy to be somewhere. You know, I'm always happy to help. But to, to answer your question about representation, yes, I'd please. actually love to see, show of hands in this room, how many of you actually feel represented in the media? And that can be represented in terms of like depression, anxiety, like any personality traits. So is it, if you feel represented, raise your hand. There's right. Yeah. yeah. You don't, you don't, have, have, you don't between, have to. I'm, I'm the glad. difference between uh, represented at all and well <laughs> represented. Yeah. I yeah. was like, but just you'll even look at that. The amount of different colors in this room. The majority of people, I'm going to say, are white in this room. And most of you still didn't raise your hand. That still means there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. Not that's being something addressed. going on that's not being addressed. But like for the most part, a lot of popular media 
is made for white people. And and that's not good, bad, good, bad, right or wrong, because, you know, white people make up a large part of the population. However, there's still that other part of the population that I, I, I hate that I just called us others, but... <laughs> I'm offended? I, I, I am offended, too. I'm going to go <laughs> discipline myself. But, like, but, yeah, there's another part of the population that don't have that representation. And then when we do put on cosplay, there's a lot of things that happen. Not all of it's positive. So I want to pass it down to you guys. And and pretty much, just I guess it's kind of, I guess at least two things to say about that. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. OK, fantastic. Um, pretty much that, um, I guess one is like the beauty of how identification could be so transcendent. He just said it a second ago. He's not black saber tooth. He's just saber tooth. And that there are these characters that we could connect with and that it is it has not always been the case but it's starting it's only just starting mm -hmm. to become a more welcoming atmosphere where we can um kind of say yeah this is who i connect to yeah this is who i relate to that person doesn't usually look like me but i'm going to make it work um and i think that the fact that identification is so powerful because oh, this is something I want to say before but I think I could bring back now is like when I um, I'm on the crisis line someone will actually say but how did this person get through it and we could walk through and it becomes a form of modeling and it makes you feel a little bit stronger which is the power of representation and yeah the people of color definitely it's most it's not just mostly white people that are represented it's mostly white guy, yeah. cis, straight, and not neurodiverse. And it's a big old world out there. And we are starting to see smatterings of it. We are starting to thank fortune, see more people of color represented, more queer people. And um, we are beginning to get trans as well. And I think neurodiverse is mm. kind of sort of starting to, and I think that may be next. We get a mention of Polaris from The Gifted that was on for like a hot oh, yeah. second. Mm -hmm. I love that show, oh my God. Mm. Um, she, we got a mention of her being bipolar, yep. which wasn't really, it got a mention, but then it wasn't expressed. We didn't see it be part of her life. Uh, just got a mention or two. We then get um, But that's a where it goes with so many shows and stuff right now. And it's not just like, mental health and gender and uh, war whatever you identify but even like i've noticed uh the hiv conversation is still very quiet in media and so bohemian rhapsody came out that's a big part of freddie mercury's life and it's like kind of a footnote in the movie that's kind of touched on but didn't really talk about how it really impacted freddie and then uh rocket man i was very fascinated by this the rocket man bonus features if you've seen the movie all of the deleted scenes or an entire storyline they cut from the movie all about HIV. They didn't think that that could be shown to audiences. Because of international distribution. And I guess one last thing, and then I definitely want to pass it to Jordan, which is that, um, but now we're also kind of like, some are starting to get the spotlight, like we were talking about more people of color and more queer representation. But I think also next would be, um, like we were saying, the neurodiversity, because we're starting to get back into coding. And some of you may be familiar that for a while, the only queer characters we had were coded, mainly Disney villains, mm -hmm. and a few others from the 60s, um, like a lot of the... Uh, 80s uh, cartoon villains, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. a lot of 80s and cartoon a, villains. And a lot of the support cast of Bewitched, for example. But, and we're starting to see that now with, for example, Entrapta from She-Ra or Peridot from Steven Universe. They are very much showing, for example, autistic traits. They have been called the autistic princess or the autistic gem. And Shira, for example, is so beautiful in how it finally represents its, uh, its um, queer diversity. It's a champion of that. And I asked the creator, what about this character that seems very autistic? Well, she's based by one of our artistic, autistic writers. Oh, that's great. Is she canon autistic? Well, we're not going to give that label. Okay, so it's coded. Here we are. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the hard thing because a lot of media, maybe it's been changing recently, uh, has a hard time with actually putting out a neurodiverse character, like letting, 
by kind of showing that there's a struggle and not turning it into a punchline because I am not Sheldon Cooper. Yeah. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But beyond that, as I, I relate say, a lot to Sheldon, honestly. Sometimes. <laughs> but that's not one I want to put out there. Uh, but as we've been saying, representation is more than just what's visible. It could be your lifestyle, it could be your career, it could be an experience that everyone has got, that some people have gone through. Like, I'm a social worker, and the only positive social worker who I think I've ever seen in media is Cobra Bubbles from Lilo and Stitch. Oh, wow. I, I defy you to find another one who's wow. betrayed in a positive light. And he wasn't until the end, by the way. Yeah. He was surprised. Yes. And then when it comes, oh. um, uh, go, then go when ahead. it comes to like representation and stuff too, you still have to look at okay, yeah, there there is a diverse cast, but is that diversity based in stereotypes? Because yeah, they'll have an entirely, but but it's like like the show, it, it's not even uh, like a cartoon well, or anything. The, but like the, the problem the, with casting right now as an actor is that they're just ticking boxes. Right. They're not actually casting on a full spectrum for talent. And making it, they're just making sure, right. oh, we have this box and this box and this box, For and now press. let's just merge right. it into the storyline, and it, great. It's like since we representation all, is not tokenism. Exactly. Yeah. It's like like we like we've all basically dated ourselves up on this stage. But like, if anybody remembers the show <laughs> The Real World on MTV. Oh my God. That was basically just yeah. like, okay, we need a crazy black dude. We need an alcoholic somebody. We need a lesbian. We need a gay guy. And then we need them to be completely opposite and at edge with each other and stuff. Yeah. So like, so we can just have drama and stuff like that. That's not representation. That's just like, okay, let's just entertain people who like stereotypes. Yeah, that, that's and basically and drawn together in real life. Right. And it's almost making fun of like a culture of people at the same time. Uh, what I'm actually curious on this conversation is that I think everyone in this room knows how poorly things are represented. Yeah. What can we do, the people in this room, to actually help with that? And I honestly, this is probably the only area that I will talk positively about social media. Is yeah, that because we're, get, we're getting to that. Don't yeah, worry. It's a double-edged yeah. thing. The, the more you normalize the conversation, the more we are sitting here in this room talking about right. it right now and in public the more it's just going to be part of stuff that shows up because it's normal. Like, so um, going on that, there's like one, one piece of media that's always been about diversity and like celebrating different cultures and stuff. Uh, it's actually just gotten back to that after so long of not being, it's the comic book, The X-Men. Uh, the X-Men is basically, uh, they had some bumps, and not everything is perfect about the X-Men at all, because they used uh, the modeled after Malcolm X and Dr. King, but they made it two white dudes, but, you know, whatever. Um, we're not, and again, we're, Professor we're, X is the walking, talking um, example of white privilege. Yes, yes, and he's got some major problems right now in the comics that I'll talk to you about later, but... Um, <laughs> But it's, we'll it's be meeting right in the hallway afterwards to talk about that. Just but it's like, like the X Men is like both cry. the good and the bad of how representation works because everybody is represented in the X Men. However, in the entire Marvel universe, not just like the just like in the movies, the X Men are put over here, and everybody else is over here. The X Men are hated for who they are, for who how they were born, except they got the same powers and abilities as all everybody else on the Avengers and Spider Man and everything. Mm. So. It's it's one of those things where like yeah they're not seen as a threat yeah right it's like we 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 celebrating this but at the same time it's just over there if you want it now if you want Captain America and Avengers and stuff you can come over here the things how we can fix it is again having these conversations having these panels having like everybody just like speaking up when you see something like hey you know what I don't feel like I'm represented and you guys want it, it's a it's a money thing for the most part because you're consuming the media. So they need you to consume it, so you tell them what you want. And if you don't get mm -hmm. it, don't well, pay This is why I love what you just said about how you're just saber-tooth and you're not black saber-tooth. Right. And I think that needs to be a post on, like, Instagram. where it, it you're, will where, be. Don't where, worry. You hashtag, <laughs> where you hashtag cosplay and you get the attention of everybody that's looking in the community, but then your conversation itself is about how you're identifying. Right. It's like, this is just me and this is who I am and it, let's not make it about color. And that helps normalize the conversation. We also have to talk about quality representation. There yes. is this huge um, saying, especially in the neurodiverse communities, it's called nothing about us without us. 
And what I kind of always have burned in my mind when we think about um, representations of race is that, or um, I almost said Orphan is the new black, Blech. Orange, Orange is the new black is a very diverse show. And, um, and you look at their writer's room. Yeah. It is all a bunch of white ladies. And then we see who was on board for the final um, for doing all of the creative decisions for the final decision of Game of Thrones. And not to surprise anyone, but there were no women. And a few people had some questions about how the female characters were handled in its final Let's season. Let's just have them looking out of windows for eight episodes. That was literally Cersei Lannister and all season. She got paid. She got, she got, I mean, I, I, I mean, would love a grip looking out windows and then have our, our main mother of dragons just go batshit crazy. Like, I understand that they were building up to that point, but they could have given us some, some narrative. Yes. And it's like, yes. oh, they killed my best friend. Let's burn everybody down. Like, hold on. What just happened in between that? It's, just, it's just like all women flip a switch and go that crazy. That's a great story the to put out The same week that everything was going on in Alabama and we were losing our rights and our autonomy, it was meme after memes of bitches be crazy, bros before hoes. And that was very pleasant for a very pleasant week in America for women. Uh. No, there's not much I can really add to that, unfortunately <laughs> not. It's... All right, so um, uh, do you have any more or can we? We can go to the next All right, one. cool. Uh, all right, so let, let, let's move on to, like, so, so we're talking loosely about uh, nerd culture online. Uh, let, let's talk about some of our experiences with the internet, both good and bad. <laughs> Because Sorry. the internet is a wonderful place. It can be the best thing in the world. It can be kind of creepy because because you can like I I can think about something right now on my phone and pull up an ad for it later, and that's just weird. But um, so I never thought about the thinking about. It. I know if you say it out loud, but like I feel like I've thought I'm, I'm about serious. things that have appeared. I've thought about shoestrings, and I had nothing but long ads of shoestrings all day, and I just was like, I'm just gonna take a nap. But um. <laughs> But yeah, so let, let's talk about some of the, the, the positive and negative experiences that some of us have occurred on the internet, have, have come across on the internet, and how we dealt with that. Like, let's start with Jordan. Okay, I'll start this one. Um, well, I think it was mentioned at the beginning that I am a fan, among many things, of My Little Pony. I am a brony, or have been one, since it just ended today. In order to get here, I had to miss the week-long series finale and I regret that. I deeply regret that. Not, not because I missed the episode when it aired. I can catch the episode any time. But because I loved watching the streams with hundreds of other peoples, watching the comments go by, being able to make jokes. Being and part of the I, community. Being part of that community. I can guarantee you that as the credits were rolling, people were lingering for like five, ten minutes congratulating each other on staying through to the very end. And that type of community that exists within fandoms, that you can just follow one thing to another, make new friends, make new connections, uh, without leaving your chair. I, I can make a hundred new friends without even putting on pants. And that is, <laughs> That's a, the, that dream, is right the greatest there. invention that humanity has come up with so far. Jordan, it's have you American been reading dream. my diary? Because, <laughs> like... <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of... Uh, I, 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 I didn't have that with My Little Pony, but Once Upon a Time and Game of Thrones, I love to live-tweet those episodes and the communities the around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though the costumes on Once were amazing. Uh, and I fortunately got to know a lot of the cast on that and got to be part of their conversations with the audience that was happening for once. And then me and my roommate, Trina, who is in the audience, would watch Game of Thrones together and live tweet. And we had this like tr unspoken tradition that every episode of Game of Thrones end, we just wouldn't talk. It was always just one of those, like, I have to process what's going on. And then I processed by going on Twitter and reading all of the tweets that were coming in and like retweeting things I related to and just feeling like I was connected to this entire world watching the show right now and all of us being like, I can't believe that just happened. There, we're definitely going to talk about the dark side of the internet for yes. in a minute because there's yes. a lot to say, but I will have to say this and because I feel it must be said. How many of us would be in this room and know each other if not for social media and the internet being what it is. Um, 
there was a post that a friend of mine just put on one day, what would be a good panel for a con? I messaged him, I've done mental health before, and then we all got together. Yeah. We just got introduced through Facebook through, Messenger. I just met these three people in person for the first time today. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's all been pretty much social media up until this point. And it's the internet it, again. It's a beautiful place, but at the same time, you got to take the good with the bad because a lot of positive things can happen on the internet, and so many negative and things. Hold can on, happen. just to finish that, and then let's yeah. definitely open those Please. floodgates because there's a lot of floodgate. Yeah. Um, just to kind of finish that point, it's like that is how it's how we get to know each other at all, and it's this form of connection. And there are some people. There are, um, for example, those with disability who aren't able to leave their own homes or they're not verbal and they're able to find people they connect to. It is so important to then bring it back into the real world and it's important to take the right lessons from it, yes. But the fact that, and yeah, it's a double-edged thing, but the fact that it makes the world a little smaller and that we are able to find each other and that would have been impossible before, it's powerful. However. Yeah, so. uh, So, like, the Internet, like, again, it's it's basically how we communicate now. It used to be messenger pigeons. Then it went to, like, letter. Messenger, and everybody. Wow, we it, went back. What, no, I'm just, no, <laughs> but uh, the, point, the point that I'm making well, is, like. We're not that old. Right. Let's the, fox them. <laughs> fox Are we? The point that I'm making is, like, every time when someone, when someone complains about a new form of communication, it's already happened before. People complain the same way that people complain about the Internet now. They complain about books. Mm. Like, they complain about newspapers the same way, the telephone, all that stuff. So we're all, all we're, it's the same thing over and over it's again. It's the same thing, but now it's the volume. And now, and, and yeah. cause, because information gets spread faster and faster, and now it's instantaneous. Everybody here has a computer in their pocket with the entirety of human history in their Everybody hand. in here can start their own news site online. Right now. Right now. But, like, the thing is, it's like, with that, with all that awesomeness, some people who are just not as positive as they would say could be also have access to this stuff. And uh, me being a black person who cosplays, uh, I, I hit my mute button a lot on, on Twitter. Uh, there's certain things that I just don't go into because for my own mental health, like I don't seek out anything that's going to just like disturb me or anything like that. If it comes my way, I'll deal with it, but I'm not looking for it. Um, it's was one of those things where like there's there's a hashtag called 28 days of black cosplay uh that is yeah i love it it's a beautiful thing like every february it's like 28 days of black cosplay is awesome uh but however it's 365 for me 66 in leap Mm -hmm. years and it's it's something i can't get onto but sometimes when i i'll see a cosplay i saw one yesterday actually i saw see a cosplayer in blackface Yesterday? Yes. Here? Yeah, yeah, yes. In this Boo, building. As the f- yeah, in this building. And, and it is a testament to my patience that I didn't approach this person. But uh-huh. uh, it, it's one of those, like, cosplay is a beautiful thing. It's one of my favorite hobbies. I don't, I think everybody should do it. If you want to do it, get on there. However, there are some offensive cosplays. I've seen exactly two. Uh, yesterday, Blackface, and two in person. Yesterday, Blackface, and WonderCon earlier this year, there was a group of guys in Nazi uniforms. Yeah, <laughs> these things happen. These things affect all of us as a people because there are some things that are not okay. You know, those are the things that are absolutely not okay. So I want to ask the panel, how do you guys deal with the things that are not okay? All right, I have got great answers for that. Um, unfortunately, I don't deal with too much trolling. Mm -hmm. And insensitivity when it comes to the internet. I know it's out there, but I've been very fortunate to have very mild encounters with that. Especially, uh, I'm a co-host for TheOneRing.net and a lot of other big nerdy channels, so I have a lot of attention on me. But what I do struggle with is the popularity contest of social media. Oh, I was like, that was brought up. So, like, uh, I, I run an Instagram account called Disney Observer. I was like, yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, I was like, and, and we do a ton of Disney stuff all the time, and so our photos are high quality, and they're bright and colorful, and our content is usually before anyone else has it, and you'll post so this photo that you're like stoked about, and it gets 18 likes, and you've got 10,000 followers in two hours, and after two hours, if you don't have more likes than that, Instagram stops showing your content in the feed, yeah. and I just sit there going, nobody likes me. 
And literally that's where my mental health goes. And I have a real hard time struggling with that to the point that like when I post, I have to like turn off notifications on Instagram and not look at it for a day and then come back and try to see what's there. But then also if I'm not commenting when people are commenting in those first two hours, it hurts the algorithm and it's yeah. a constant struggle for me. So I have a personal account. My, uh, it's Uncool Rockstar, where I really talk about everything. I talk about my mental health. I talk about real life stuff. I, I encourage positivity. I give tips on meditation. I talk about food and nutrition, because I reversed four autoimmune diseases in my body by changing my diet and lifestyle. And I talk about everything nerdy. And I started to unfollow almost everyone I know in real life, because I just didn't want it in my feed. There's some things that like people I would see that I kind of knew that make me anxious. There's people that like I'm no longer friends with and it would make me sad. Uh, and just uh, like people that just post content that I don't care about and instead curated an account full of self care and positivity and motivational quotes and uh, things that make me smile and just stuff like that. So now whenever social media gets me down, I open my account and I just have this great feed of just stuff that just makes me so happy. Most sites will allow you to do that. Even news sites do. My news site, my news site looks like how news used to be. I have squirrels riding water skis and everything. It's, <laughs> it's, I watch the news and I'm the happiest I've ever been sometimes, but mm -hmm. I know when the real news comes around. Mm. But, and I guess it's kind of about finding that balance. I definitely have stuff to say, but uh, do you want to before I do? Uh, I don't always take my own best advice. I've gotten into fights with people on the internet. Uh, anonymous. No one has ever done that before, Jordan. Yeah. I know. That's unheard of on Al Gore's <laughs> internet. I know. Right? People, people were wrong and they needed to know. Uh, but, uh, after, but after a certain point of fighting these nameless, anonymous, maybe trolls who took common sense, said, Yes, but actually the answer is no, and just kept going on with that moon logic. I have to ask myself, okay, I've spent the last hour and a half like constructing this perfectly worded and researched and cited with, with citations yeah. of all this stuff, and I'm like, this doesn't get me anywhere. Like even in the care. even in the best case scenario, this person sees me and they bow down and they say, "Oh, you are so wise. I will listen to your yeah. ways." That does not help me as a human being. That there is no little counter in the corner of my internet that goes up for every argument I've won. And after a certain point, you just need to learn what battles are worth pursuing, and. What battles can be fought indirectly? We already yep. talked about supporting with uh, social media, with liking things that deserve more attention, with spending your money in ways that tells people what's really going on. Because we have to remember that even these less than social people who are attracting lots of attention to themselves, they're often the vocal minority. And we can't judge uh, views opposed to us based on what this one troll on Reddit is spewing out there. And we just have to really remember how, um, how spun everything you see, especially on social media, is. It's that I kind of have two points that I want to make about that. One is this, that um, I have mixed feelings about the rise of cosplay celebrities um, nowadays, and it's just that, I guess then it just kind of goes hand in hand with the gatekeeping, the people that say like, mm -hmm. oh, you're not doing this this way, or you're not doing this right, oh, you got this, I recognize you got this at like a store or whatever, and it's just the fact that when people weaponize social media to make other people feel bad, I am glad that there is now this um, movement to kind of go uh, backlash against that. And there is this whole, and we're trying to tear down these gatekeepers, and thank God, because, but sometimes to compete, it could be paralyzing. Sometimes when mm -hmm. you see all this stuff on your feed and you think you're the only person who doesn't have their life figured out, it can feel paralyzing. And we need to remember that 
we're all doing our best. And I think something that I have personally been struggling with is like how to still engage in social media, because it's 2019, you have to somewhat, and not get overwhelmed. And I have been trying to figure out, okay, I'm only gonna do it this time of the day. Oh, I'm only going to scroll, I'm only going to do three scrolls, and then I'm going to just read up, and then till it ends. Like, I've been, I guess that's everyone nowadays, and if we are wise, we'll start teaching it in our schools to kids. Mm -hmm that we need to figure out what our personal relationship to technology and information is. How much of our time are we gonna spend getting caught up and observing and commenting in life instead of living it? Yeah, there's, that, that's a big part of it. I mean, I definitely, in terms of the cosplay celebrities, the nerd influencers and everything else that's out there too, you also have this problem of the brands and the cons and everyone toting them further so that nobody else can break through so that they're they're the ones that are getting money pumped into their accounts so that their photos actually show up in your feeds so they're getting more followers and no one else is having a chance and that's part of it but uh there was actually this beautiful post on instagram yesterday that i shared in a story that i just want to read because i this none of us could say it better than this don't let instagram fool you there are people who have three to nine likes who have plenty of friends People with 100 plus likes who are lonely as, pardon the French, fuck. <laughs> uh, couples who look so happy yet are miserable as hell. Mm -hmm. People who don't post pictures of themselves and their significant other but are in a beautiful loving relationship. People who know each other very well but appear as strangers. People who are up to their neck in debt yet live lavish Instagram life. Remember, this is not real life. Appearances are just that. We need to be careful about performative happiness. All right. So we got like a, a couple minutes left and, and beautiful points from everybody as well. We got a couple minutes left. So I, I kind of want to open up the floor to some questions, so some Q&A. So if you have a question, uh, please stand up and ask away. Yep. Go ahead. The thing about anything when it comes to like the online community is making sure that you have a solid support system in real life. I was like, because no matter what you do, you will have people that want to tear it down. Yep. I was like, and unfortunately with the internet, that number is 10% larger than you would normally have in a real life interaction. And you have to just remember that it's nothing personal. It's like, uh, I love the book, The Four Agreements. One of the four agreements is that you don't take anything personally, and that's positively or negatively. I was like, because whatever's going on is literally, that person might just be lonely and they're trying to get someone to talk to them. Like, you don't know what's going on behind that curtain. And as long as you're there to help remind these people if it does affect them that it's, you're doing what you're gonna do, and if they are changing their content and it's different from how they started, people grow and your ch interests change, and that's, it's completely okay. Uh, I was going to say that, yeah, part of it is about not putting all of your self-esteem eggs in one basket, being able to expand upon how you view yourself and making sure that you are taking breaks, that there are other things that you're engaging in. Uh, but beyond that, part of it is perspective. Because someone who likes your thing may have good taste, but that is no quality of who they are as a person. Right. People can love something that's seen as very good quality and still be nasty. That's where a lot of toxicity comes in. Star Wars. And, <laughs> and there are uh, a lot of fandoms that are very toxic. A lot of fandoms. Yeah. And a lot of people 
do poorly with change over time. That's a quality of being human as much as not liking being wrong. Right. Uh, so these people are responding on a basic human concern that what was once for them when they were there and it felt special, that doesn't feel the same. And that's just part of being a human being. That's not, as they said, it's nothing personal. Right, it's like the phrase, this is ruining my childhood. Absolutely nothing can retroactively ruin something that has already happened to you, okay? Except the TARDIS. Ex <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and Barry uh, Allen in the Flash series. Uh, but no, yeah, I know, I have serious issues with that. But, um, but yeah, nothing can retroactively take away your childhood. What happened, happened. And it's a beautiful thing, that's great. However, someone else has a childhood too and we need new stories for them as well, you know? So they need something to latch on to because have, if anyone in here has younger relatives, nieces, nephews, or anything like that, they look at you bored as hell when you're trying to tell them about the things that you're trying to tell them about because they're like, uh, I don't really know, I don't care about this. And you show S Star Wars from the 70s to to a child now and they're looking at the CGI like hey we've come a long way from mm -hmm. this I can see the strings on that toy what's yeah. going on well, you case know. in point I had friends that had never seen Spaceballs that watched it right before my birthday last Ooh, month how'd that, that go that didn't find Spaceballs amusing no. because everything's so outdated in terms of tech and movies then I was like it's a solid comedy like how do you but if you didn't see it in that time period you don't like, have that attachment yeah. to it so like because there's parts in that movie that are completely boring because there's no sound in it there's like no musical score so it yeah. takes away from it anybody else got any questions I think we got time for like one one or two more yeah, oh we have one minute just, left if we have less than a minute but go ahead I love I love memes, but I don't like self-destructive memes like that because I don't I, I don't I don't want to make positive a very negative kind of mm -hmm. trait. I, I, I'm wording that kind of wrong, but like because I me, me personally my personal Instagram turned into like pictures of me and my life to straight up memes out of nowhere. But like I love them, but at the same time those ones kind of be like, oh well, it's great to have mental health issues and stuff. Not always, you know. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, It could be a way to, it could be to make friends. It could be a way to make friends, but sometimes I see that as like, sometimes it's a cry for help because some people don't know how to reach out for that help. And that's another thing that we need to really get into. Like, listen, yeah. lis really listening Active to listening. what people are saying without them saying it sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah. Active listening is a big thing. I, I think also with memes, uh, it's not just about the person that makes it, or, uh, but it, the audience that's getting it. Half the people are gonna relate and half of them are not going to, and I worry about the people that don't take it as like, it's okay to make fun of this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody, mm -hmm. uh, since I think we have about 15 seconds till the guys in suits come in, yeah. break through the ceiling and run us all out. Let's, I let's give our let, socials so everybody can find we us. Give, before yeah. we give our socials, let's give us some, some resources that people can reach out like further with in regards to like what, what, what your journey is. Um, I have a list. Me a second. And while he's getting the second, there was one thing I want to say about social media representation. There's this line from one of my favorite plays called Into the Woods, and I think it was after 2016 where I finally began to really understand what that line meant. Some, no one is alone, someone is on your side, and someone is on their side. Yep. They are not alone, no one is alone. So for whatever you're going through, and when we come back to the memes, it is sometimes nice to know that you're, you're not, not alone, alone in your struggles, yeah. but the assholes have a lot of fans and a lot of followers as well. The thing is, is to kind of be interactive, be aware, be intentional about what's in your life. Don't block out the world, but just try to navigate it the best you can to be stay sane. Okay, so uh, a couple resources real quick. Uh, we have California's first toll-free mental health line at Eight, I, I have this, so talk to me in the hallway if you need this number. I'm going to read real fast. 855-845-7415. You should Google it, too. Yep. At, at this point, I don't feel like reading it that fast is going to help anyone. So if you would like the resources, talk to me. come and talk to us. Please. Or if you have if, any questions. That's if you want to follow all of us uh, and keep in touch after this, where can they find you, Aaron? Your favorite skinny man on Instagram. I am Uncool Rockstar on any social media platform, Uncool Rockstar, or, or Disney Observer if you want my Disney account.